Well, good morning, everybody. Whether you're joining us here in the building or joining us in one of our online formats, we're certainly glad that you're here. And we just invite you to stand if you're able as we enter into worship this morning.
your King forever. Good morning. Happy Sunday. We have this morning five, not one, not two, but five individuals. As soon as I can get my suit jacket. The struggle is real. Thank you. Thank you. I don't look like a vampire this morning, do I? All right. This is the last time I play drums for you guys. All right. My five individuals, if you will, come join me. Rachel, and Alexander, and Rylan, and Abigail Whiteman, and Marlena Lindgren. If you all want to come this way, though, now that you're all settled over there, if you want to come this way and kind of, yep, come out to like the TV. Awesome. All these people are fantastic people. Rachel has done a great job doing our tech work back there, and she's come along and become part of the family. And these are her three kids. I'll try to get out of the way so everybody can see. And these are her three kids. We got Rylan and Abby and Alex. They are talented in their own right, uh, musically, artistically. Um, so hopefully their talents will be able to be utilized here at PaxNAS in the soon future as well. Uh, Rylan and Alex are just about to graduate next week, so that's awesome. <laughs> Marlena, well, I don't know if I have enough time, <laughs> but she is, she's joining the ranks with her hubby, Randy, and Marlena and I have been through a little bit of a journey in conversation about uh, joining as a member and what that means for her, and uh, she is she should come to a spot where she is thrilled uh, to be joining Pax Naz and, and, and walking into the future with us. So we are super, super thrilled. Now, I'm going to stand in front of you. I'll probably face you. I'm sorry. The back of my head is not amazing. I'm just going to read some stuff, and then I will ask you when it's time to respond. Either I do or I will. Very simple. And then I have some certificates for all of you. Today, today, we affirm again the agreed statements of belief of the Church of the Nazarene. That there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That the Old and New Testament scriptures given by plenary inspiration contain all truth necessary to faith and Christian living. That human beings are born 
with a fallen nature and are therefore inclined to evil and that continually. That the finally impenitent are hope, hopelessly and eternally lost. That the atonement through Jesus Christ is for the whole human race. And that whoever repents and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is justified and regenerated and saved from the dominion of sin. That believers are to be sanctified wholly, subsequent to regeneration through faith in Jesus. That the Holy Spirit bears witness to the new birth and also to the entire sanctification of believers. And that our Lord will return, the dead will be raised, and the final judgment will take place. Do you support these truths? Do you acknowledge that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? And do you believe that he saves you now? If so, respond, I do. I do. Excellent. Desiring to unite with the Church of the Nazarene and Pax Naz, do you commit to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, as expressed by the covenant of Christian character and conduct? Do you commit to the mission of God as expressed in the doctrine, fellowship, and work of the Church of the Nazarene? Will you support the teachings of the Church of the Nazarene and strive with God's help to grow in your understanding and practice of the same in a way that enhances the witness of the church? Will you endeavor in every way to glorify God by a humble walk, godly conversation, and holy service? Be de devotedly giving of your so resources and by faithfully participating in the means of grace. And finally, will you follow Jesus Christ all the days of your life, abstain from all evil, and seek earnestly to perfect holiness of heart and life in the fear of the Lord? If so, respond, I will. I welcome you to the Church of the Nazarene and Pax Naz and the fellowship of this local congregation with its benefits and responsibilities. May the head of the church bless and keep you and enable you to be faithful in all good works, that your life and witness may be effective in care for the poor and the oppressed and in leading others to Jesus. I have some certificates for you, then you may all, if you want to clap, you can. Miss Marlena, yes. Miss Rachel, Miss Abigail, Mr. Alexander, Mr. Rylan. Thank you, thank you, thank you. A welcome. <sighs> Who all slept more than two hours last night? Good. Well, <laughs> nobody up here did, I'll tell you that. So I cannot be responsible for the things that come out of my mouth this morning. This one's all Jesus, you guys. Jesus, take the wheel. He didn't even know how to drive. <laughs> Did you know that? Do you ever think about that? <laughs> it's a horrible song. Jesus didn't have a driver's license. I'm just kidding. That was a joke. All right, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. The humor is normally dry. Some days it's drier than others. Ephesians chapter 2. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Sleep deprivation. We're going to look at verses 11 through 22. The title of today's message is Jesus is Our Peace. It's not super long. Uh, you're probably happy about that. But uh, have, have you been watching the news lately? Yeah. Uh, I don't even just mean the world news. I'm talking about locally. Um, Champaign, Danville, Central Illinois, United States, all over the world. 
I don't typically stay too focused on the news uh, because it can be super distracting. But there's been a significant increase in violence, in uh, crime, and just super weird stuff. I've seen some crazy stuff happening lately. Car chases. Have you ever seen so many car chases? I have literally counted 10. 10 car chases in the last couple of weeks that I have followed. Um, and maybe I wasn't noticed them before, but they sure do seem prevalent in these last few weeks. We've been walking through a lot lately. Some heavy stuff. And many of you are going through some heavy stuff this week and this weekend. And my heart is with you. That's not even mentioning what's going on around the world. Israel, have you seen the battle that's happening right now? Do you feel the battle around you? Do you wonder sometimes if we'll ever find peace? Because I know I get pretty discouraged some days. It's hard not to. So there's a guy in the Bible, though. Uh, you may have heard of him. Some people overlook him. His name's Jesus. I want to read Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. It says, Therefore, remember that formerly, formerly, you who are Gentiles by birth are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the word. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the divided wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of the household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. There's a writing method used in the Bible, and it's referred to as a chiasm. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Chiism, I think it is. Chiism. It's a strategic way of writing that, that places a main point between a couple repetitive statements that cover the same, the same topic. Now it looks a little bit like this. And if, if somebody tells you that I haven't been learning anything in my classes, you can refer them back to this. This is a chiism. We have the theme, A, followed by B, and our main point is C, followed by B and A. So the central theme is usually the focus. You'll see the letter C is placed ahead of everything in the formation that looks like an arrow pointing through the content. So this passage happens to go a little bit like this. A, without God, you were alienated. B, Jesus brought the far near. 
C, Jesus is our peace, the main point. B, Jesus proclaimed peace far and near. A, you're no longer alienated and at home with God. So you can see as it gets to the main point, it kind of comes back around in a positive light. So let's look at this just a little bit closer. We're going to look at both A and B pieces first, and then we'll end up at C. So this is what you were. This is covered in verses 11 and 12. So hatred has gone back a long time. The Jews and the Gentiles hated each other when Israel came out of Egypt. God told them to destroy the nations and not to marry them. Ultimately, they didn't live up to this. And they followed other gods. God exiled them to Babylon. When they come back, they were even more insistent on holiness and separation. This concept of separation is one of the conflicts. Jews decided that they would resort to, to name-calling. Um, and in this case, name-calling looks a little bit different in these verses. They were the circumcision because they were the ones that performed the circumcisions. And they were calling the other team the uncircumcision. So that's really weird. But the Gentiles, they had some issues as well. They were without Christ. Now don't get me wrong, Jesus was there. They had Jesus. But the promise of someone who would redeem humanity those promises were only made to the Jewish people. The Gentiles had no knowledge or expectations of a Messiah. Israel were God's people. He chose them. God's covenant with Abraham involved him becoming a great nation. Now, this covenant also involved promises to the other nations, but the other nations didn't know about it because it was always done through Israel. The Gentiles didn't know about Moses and the Israelites' journey out of Egypt where they learned of God's special love for them. The Gentiles were totally, totally separated from all the knowledge of God's people and promises. Because they were without this knowledge, the Bible also says that they were without hope. That's where they were. The Greek word that is translated to without God is actually the word we get atheist from. So you'll, you'll find it interesting that the Gentiles called the Jews atheists because they only had one God and no one could see him physically. They didn't have an image that they carried around to, to worship nothing tangible for them to see. So the Jews, they, they also called the Gentiles atheists because they had a lot of gods and many images, but none were living. All of this separation between the Jews and the Gentiles is said to be ceremonial at its core, simply because Jews had circumcisions and Gentiles didn't. That's where the name-calling came into play. It was mostly political and psychological, but it was also a little bit theological because they were separate from God and had no hope. And then we move to the section that says, this is what we are now. In the verses leading up to this passage that we read this morning, up to verse 11, we see that we're, we're dead but God made us alive. We see the word but, which indicates change. Change being, now we have access to God. We're citizens of the saint, with the saints now. We're members of God's house. We no longer have to meet with God in the temple to worship him. We're becoming his temple. It's a heart issue. Before, 
we were separated by the veil. Now you hear that sometimes, but the veil was a physical, real thing. You had to be spotless. You had to follow the law to a T before you could come into God's presence behind the veil. And did you know that they used to tie a rope around the ankle of the high priests before they went in so that if they died, they could pull the body out? Also, did you know that they had a backup wife on standby in case while they were in there, the first wife died? True stories. Can you imagine being that scared to simply talk to God? It's terrifying. But this is what Jesus did. Verse 13 is the last verse that talks about who we used to be. We were once far, but now we're near. Verse 17 says he came to proclaim peace. Gentiles had no hope. They weren't a part of the club. But now they're included. They're citizens and members of God's house. So we have a tendency to identify with the Jewish people in this whole story because we know Jesus. We're reading this from a different perspective because most of us know Jesus. We know he was the Messiah. So as we're reading this, we're, we're identifying with the Jewish people. And you're, you're sitting back thinking, oh, those silly Gentiles. Don't they get it? They could just fix this with God. But guess what? You were the Gentile. And it was all fixed because of Jesus. You were separate from God. You had no knowledge of God. You didn't know the promises. And Jesus fixed it. It wasn't easy. But he made both groups one. He couldn't just say, hey, get along like some bratty siblings. I'm sure you've dealt with that. Play. Never? Okay. But the, but the issue and the separation was so much greater than that. The primary issue between the Jews and the Gentiles was the law. The law was perceived by Jews as the way to God. But the Gentiles didn't have the law. They didn't have the knowledge. And it's not that he removed the law as a good way to follow God. There are still good parameters to live by. But he removed the law as a requirement to enter into a relationship with God. You no longer have to go to the temple or the mountain or behind the veil to worship him. He's right here. He's right here. It's a matter of the heart now. All we have to do is open up our heart and our minds and our mouths and speak. Jesus fixed every single piece of that. It all died on the cross with him. The veil was physically torn that day. This, this veil was, a, I think they called it a six foot thick. Can you imagine that curtain was as thick as I am tall? Can you imagine tearing that? Only God, right? We don't always connect with this story. We don't have a direct connection with the Jewish people. So it's hard to realize that awful feeling that they had of separation and then the joy of the peace that came to them. It's important for us, though. Tells us about the peace that Jesus made between us and God. It reminds us that we can overcome conflict through Jesus. We're challenged to invite those who don't have the knowledge that we do into a relationship with Jesus so that they're no longer separated like we once were. 
we're challenged to make peace through Jesus in all of our relationships. And in the midst of struggle, in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of grief, we just look to Jesus and we open our hearts and the relationship is there. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for sending Jesus to become our peace. Thank you so much for tearing down the walls that were between us and you and allowing us to commune with you directly. I pray that you'll continue to be with us, Lord, and just show us the way. We still have some quirks. We still have a lot of work to do, Lord, but, but we know you're there. And we thank you for everything that you've done. And we pray that we can be a light in the community, a light to the world, to bring them back to you and show them that there's no longer a need to feel separate. And Lord, this morning, specifically, I'd like to pray for some families that we have here that are going through some sickness, that have, that have dealt with a family member passing, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will wrap your arms around those that are hurting right now and give them peace and comfort to know that you are in control even when it doesn't make sense. That you are there in their hearts. No separation. All they have to do is reach their arms out for a hug. Be with those who are sick right now, Lord. Wrap your healing arms arms around them. Be with the doctors and the nurses and the medical teams so that they know exactly what to do during the time they need to do it. I pray for us all now as we move forward that we would know God's hand is on us every single second of every single day. It's not going to always be easy, but it doesn't have to be miserable. Because there's hope on the other side. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing one more song as we go today. And this song follows the same format as Adam's sermon. It talks about who we were and where we were dead in our sin until Jesus came and brought us hope and peace. Would you stand with us as we sing one more time? shouting crucify could have come from these lips of mine the dirty shame was killing me it would take a miracle to wash me
in the freedom that God gives us and in his peace you are dismissed.